I really enjoyed working with Erica Badu. She's a good actress. And you never saw the movie. I didn't. Because oh, it, well, she's great. Because there's a kid in it. So you wouldn't see the movie? No. You, you saw the stupid. I stopped watching the Brady Bunch when Oliver was introduced. When they put in the kid, it's the, it's the, it's the shark jumping moment. <laughs> what? <laughs> I never watched it because you always... You should do more talking. Welcome to Discography, the podcast that gives Gen X music maniacs a chance to smell like teen spirit again by connecting with the brotherhood obsessed with rating the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever mattered. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and with three new episodes each week, you're going to gain a comprehensive knowledge of an act's history and output in the time it takes to listen to one album. And in this episode of Discography, we'll be turning our spray cans for the fifth and final time on John Landis. Although if you're a Patreon member at the Lieutenant Tier and above, you'll get a full bonus episode, Volume 6 of this series, in which the legendary director talks to Discography about seeing the Beatles live as a kid, how it went down when John went to Disney on a normal weekday with Michael Jackson, and the very odd tale behind Paul McCartney's title track contribution to Spies Like Us. You'll get that episode. It's a full episode, not some outtake show, but uh, we decided to go Patreon with it. Again, that's patreon.com slash discography and you'll get access to that episode. Over the course of this particular program, though, John talks to Discography about the super noticeable changes in Michael Jackson's personality that international fame brought to him during their work on the black and white video, his very favorites of his own filmography, and most importantly, exactly what kind of tip that you can expect when waiting on director David Fincher. And I'm talking from personal experience. Coming up, we've got an endlessly interesting nine-hour multi-parter interview with the great David Paho, plus interviews with Vashti Bunyan, Lorraine, The Association, and Anthony Fantano. So don't miss out. Open up your listening app right now and click follow. And away we go then with the final installment, if you're some kind of Patreon cheapskate, of the John Landis tapes. After Thriller and the video and everything, um, they never, you know, Michael's company, MJ Productions, were cheating. They, they were not paying me. They're, I have a big piece of that. And they were giving me, they were lying. It's cheating. The music business, they were lying. How shocking. Never. <laughs> um, that, you know, I would complain about the movies accounting thing, and I remember everybody, lawyers, everyone saying, boy, you're lucky you're not in the music business. <laughs> and my little experiences in the music business, they're right. What happened there was I was suing Michael. In fact, I was suing him for years and years, not him and his company, really, to get my money because they were lying. From and, Thriller. On Thriller, and so you know, I wrote it, directed it, produced it. Like, I, had a, you, you had you had not gotten a cent. Is no, that, is that no, right? nothing. So they they were dishonest. So I was suing him, and so even though we were still friendly, it wasn't like I was anxious to go rush in and work with MJJ Productions again. In fact, when Michael died, is the only way my suit got settled because when someone dies. Everything in their estate has to be resolved before it can go through probate. You have to resolve everything. So they settled. I, I now I get healthy checks from because now the accounting comes through Sony instead of MJJ Productions. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting maybe forty percent of what I should be getting as opposed to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but at least I'm getting money now. And uh, but I but millions they fucked me out of. So 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 the, what happened was. There was a company called Propaganda Production Company, and they contracted with Sony or CBS or whoever it was. I think Sony. Whose album? Uh, Dangerous. Dangerous was, I don't even remember. CBS or Sony, but to do, I don't know, six videos for the album. It was huge money, $20 million, something like that. And they had done one that only required a still session with Michael, who was a British animator, Leave Me Alone, 
which actually I like very much. It's kind of cool. The, yeah, it's kind of like a like a two dimensional. Yeah, kind of it's cool. Thing, right? Anyway, but then all the they had David Lynch, and you worked on Eraserhead as a PA, right? Not as a PA, as a schlepper. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I didn't work on the whole movie. I just worked, you know he shot that for such a long time. Remember we bumped into him at Musso and Frank's. It was the first time you'd seen him since years. Then. Yeah. yeah, he's a lovely guy. Yeah. He used to eat at Bob's Big Boy every day for 15 <laughs> years. Um, anyway, he's made some really good movies. Really good, yeah. Anyway, Dave, David Lynch and also David Fincher. Um, and there was another big director. David Fincher tips 15%. How do you know? Because I've been tipped by him many oh. times, and I'm, I need for this information to be out in the public. In any case... So they had tried to make videos with Michael, and he wouldn't show up. He was a very different guy than he was on Thriller. Um, if you look at the making of Thriller, which is a very honest and real portrayal of how it was done, it was totally real, you'll notice that I kind of treat him like a really gifted 12-year-old. Um, he was. I was so shocked to learn later he was like 21 or something. I thought he was like 17, <laughs> but... He was great. He worked really hard, and he was great, eager and enthusiastic. So what was the difference? He well, he was got more odd and had done more surgeries. On the succeeding album, Bad, after Thriller, was when the, the plastic surgery started mm -hmm. to get very, started to kind, get kind, odd, kind of a little yeah. creepy. Yeah. Yeah, it's so sad, that kind of self-loathing. What, mm -hmm. what is your take on the last four minutes of the video that were cut? Black or white? Well, you never saw the real versions of them. You know, what is my take on it? I like, like was that your idea? Was that his idea? Partly, Did you think no, here's the cut? difference. On Thriller, he was working for me. On Black or White, I was working for him. And what happened, my job, I felt, was not to make Michael look too crazy. Right, because right. his ideas that's were a tough, that's a were, tough job <laughs> his ideas were really out there and I did get some impact into it like I by that time he'd grown to be such a monster star um, and performer but he'd become like Elvis a parody of himself and he had these five dance moves you know where grabbing his nuts and going like throwing his arm in the air and turning sideways and striking these poses ah! Right, you know. And I said, you know, Mike, you're such a great dancer. He really was a great dancer. Yeah. Let's do something else. And so that I put in the Africans and the, the Thai and the Indian and the Russian. You know, I put in the Native American, different dances. And those were all correct, the national dances. And you see that he does them. He's capable of doing them. He even does the Gazatsky with the Russians. <laughs> and what was interesting, but, but he wanted to do those same moves. It really bothered me because he's so good. And it's like, Mike, uh, you can sometimes see, I don't know why they never released them now, but the Jackson 5 had a, a variety show. And, and Janet was on it too and watch those shows they're incredible and because first of all michael always has a dance number and he he and janet do fred astaire and ginger rogers and the, i kind of miss variety and, shows and the nicholas brothers forever. were on it and he would do tap dance stuff. i mean he you'd see that this guy the real thing you know and he hadn't forgive the pun defaced himself yet you know <laughs> what happened was yanni sigvatsen was in trouble because he couldn't get mike to show up and so I got a call, because Walter Yetnikoff apparently called and screamed at them and said, you know, we've spent millions of dollars. Don't rip your cock off. <laughs> yeah, he loves ripping cock off. Oh, I have off. never heard anyone, I have never heard language like that in my life. And it was literally like, oh. He's a, it must be a New Yorker. I don't know, but he was not, you know. He was not subtle. The thriller video, the, the draw kind of was to, was to re-implement the, the theatrical short. As for me, say, for you. But, but what they did is they fucked me. They had booked it, and he had a manager at that time named, he's even in Goodfellas. He's a short, what was his name? He was short, round Italian with a ponytail. Frank DeLeo. Frank DeLeo, okay. And a cigar. Frank did the right thing for Michael. He fucked me, but he did the right thing for Michael. Which what he did was he duped Thriller once it was on the air. Not the making of Thriller, but Thriller. He made like 2,000 copies and sent it to television stations all over the world and said, here, play this for free. So what happened was he, he totally destroyed my foreign sales 
I mean, totally just blew them. And my theatrical release because it was on television constantly. They, everyone else had limited windows, but he gave it for free. And it took me years to find. And finally, he Frank died several years. He finally admitted it to me. He moved to Nashville. So, the, so black but, or but white? But what he did? Well, what he did was he made the album. You got to remember what the Thriller video did. The album went back to number one and tripled its sales. You're talking about the most successful album of all time that then triples its right. sales two years or a year and a half later. So it made MTV. Because now all the record companies, the labels started spending big money on it. It's so funny to me that you created two of the most groundbreaking videos that have ever been made, and that was basically it. Well, the black reason or I... White, well, black or white was the draw, the technology... Well, here's what happened. So here's what happened. So uh, I get a call from Yanni Sigvatsen, and he said, John, would you do another video with Michael Jackson? And it was out of the blue. I said, well... They'd have to pay me because they owe me so much money. And he said, how would you do it? I said, well, you'd have to pay me. I became Chuck Berry. I said, you'd have to pay me. I want to check every Monday open until it's finished. Every Monday for how much? And I, I said, a ridiculous price. And he said, okay, I'll call you back. <laughs> and he called Michael and said, hey, Mike, you know who could make a video, your next video? Because Mike had said no. Who? He said, John Landis. Oh, I love John Landis. And so Michael calls me all excited. Will you really work with me? Aren't you suing me? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I am suing you, you know, and your crooked lawyer and all those guys. But um, what was interesting was that's how I did Black or White is I got like a bag of money like Chuck Berry every Monday. I thought it would take us three weeks to, you know. It was like three months. And you never, since that video, you have never been inspired to re-enter that art form? And well, first around? of all, they don't really do them anymore. They don't spend money on them They anymore. definitely don't send you a, a sack of cash with a dollar no sign on it anymore. <laughs> I love well, that. Also, and then if you get drunk, there's X's for eyes. But and, you know. also, the way the, mo the, the rock video business worked was, was basically there were directors who became part of production companies. Venture was part of a, I forgot what company. And then there was, uh, Tarantino had a, uh, pr called Red Band Apart. Band Apart, which I worked, I did commercials out of them. Oh, cool. But never rock videos, because the way rock videos worked is a lot of groups sent me stuff. We want a rock video for this. The way it worked was we send a dat of our new song, whether it's Dire Straits or who was it? Who, who was the big act um, guy with the lips? Aerosmith. So three or four times they would send me songs, and I would say, because they send them out to a bunch of film, a bunch of production companies, a bunch of filmmakers. And by that time, by the way, they're churning out and pure garbage. Yeah, and they'd say, "Come to us with your ideas." So people would do storyboards and just basically do a lot of work and then come and budget it and then come pitch it. And they would decide who they wanted based on concept and money. And they often would rip people off and use like that idea, yeah. it's this idea. It's the same thing when you do uh, like music for commercials. They'll like, they'll like, send us a demo for your commercial. And they'll, right, they'll they want you to, to do the work. They'll send without... out for t to 10 different composers and they'll be like, we don't really like any of those, but we're gonna take little bits of things that we <laughs> yeah. like and get this other in-house guy to do it and just do it that way. It's it, what's really, f so I said, no. I mean, I'm happy to do a video hire me and we'll work together and I'll do a video, but I'm not working for free and I'm certainly not auditioning for you. Big acts were sending me stuff all the time for years and I just said, offer me the job and I'll do it, but I'm not gonna audition for you. During this time, like you said, Michael was working for you on Thriller, then you're working for Michael. That must have been frustrating a lot. No, frustrating. It wasn't frustrating at all because I agreed to do it and I understood. You're sending him the bags of cash. Yeah. And they but, gave but me then, a lot of money. And the thing was that we talked about ideas, we talked about things. A lot of things that I didn't do, he did later, like that giant statue of him. And I said, Mike, that's <laughs> nuts. You know? And all this stuff. But on black or white, you know, he's so, I like Michael, you know. So we did the different lands. And I like, I mean, that was fun to do those transitions because they were all in camera. You know, there was no, 
opticals there. That was very clear. We went from inside to outside. And at that point, it had only been, that technology had only really there been utilized. There was no technology. No, that Terminator was, 2. It had been done. Wait, he's, he's talking wait. about the morphing technology. Yeah, the I'm morphing. To, well, uh, transition is not morphing. I thought you were talking about I'm that. talking about how he went from scene to scene. Oh, okay, okay. And it was, look at that opening. It's very cool. Even to this one thing with the Native Americans where the backdrop falls and we're at Vasquez Rocks with hundreds of horses. You know? I mean, that was fun. And then uh, he had Macaulay Culkin. One day he didn't show up for shooting. He and Mac vanished. And later it turned out. And it was like a $200,000 day. We had a Luma crane and all this mm-hmm. stuff. Didn't show up. And where were you? They went to Toys R Us and spent like fifty or $60,000. And it was like, how can you spend $50,000 at <laughs> Toys R Us? Any apparent weirdness with uh, Mike and Mac? No, I don't. Honestly, I don't know. But I No, not with Mac. I don't. I don't know. I couldn't. I never saw anything weird. I never went to uh, Neverland. Neverland. Neverland, yeah. I never went there. He invited me a lot. And he invited my kids to go home and stay. And it was just too weird for me. Yeah, yeah. So I said no. But I um, I think Michael was emotionally retarded. And, you know, but I don't know. I wasn't yeah. there. I couldn't tell you. I do know that the first kid that he paid off all that money, he was being extorted. And he panicked. And, and he never should have paid that. But I don't know, yeah. and, and I I don't want to know. You right. Know? So then right. The, the reaction to black or white uh, when it it's like premiered at the Super Bowl or something is that right? No, in fact, black or white. This is interesting. It premiered had the largest television audience in history. I think still, it premiered in over two hundred twenty three countries at the same That's time. That's crazy. That's like all you need is love. So it was like at 2 in the morning or 5 right. in the morning or 6 in the morning or 8 at night That's or so 5 cool. in, all over the world. And we were shooting. I was shooting Innocent Blood in Pittsburgh, night shooting. And it was freezing cold. And we went into a bar to watch it. By the way, I love, love Rickles in that movie. Don Rickles is so good in that movie. I like movie. Innocent Blood. I think that's entertaining, but it was too out there for people. But it was kind of, it was overlooked. That and Oscar were, were definitely overlooked. Well, Oscar, I think that the audience couldn't accept Sylvester Stallone in that part. Yeah, yeah, I think so. But I Oscar think also, was I was doing a 1929, 1930 farce, and I th- it looks good, and uh, beautiful costume, beautiful sets, and... and Amazing cast, amazing cast. Yeah. Tim Tim Curry, uh, Chaz Palminteri, Vincent Spano, Ornella Muti, Marissa Tomei. That's how she got my cousin Vinny. Actually, in your filmography, Peter if an audience doesn't accept the movie, do you feel closer to it because it was kind of overlooked? No, or not necessarily. Because I know you, you kind of feel that way about Into the Night, but not necessarily about Oscar. Into the Night. I like because it's so odd, but uh, and it's interesting. The thing about the directors. It was the first time some journalist noticed the directors. But Spies Like Us has got many more directors, you know. One of my favorite things that Spies Like Us is completely silly is at the drive-in theater in Nevada, wherever it is, the CIA guys pull up, Bruce Davison and William Prince pull up to this abandoned drive-in, and these two scruffy-looking guys with M16s come out and we're with the ace tomato company and let them in and so those two guys that's joel cohen and sam rain <laughs> nice, nice. i read that joel cohen made it i uh, made a cameo on that but it's yeah and course. it's before he was joel cohen you know <laughs> then they continue the same scene car pulls up and it pulls up in front of the refreshment stand in the desert and they're these spooks they're all these cia guys they all have earpieces and rifles and guns and stuff and uh, they're Larry Cohen, Michael Apted, Marty Brest, B.B. King. You love putting disparate people and together in the And I forgot the other guy, but it's <laughs> I, I really gotta t- whack. I got to tell you, La- Larry Cohen, one of my favorite filmmakers, my mom took me to CQ when I was 10. And you, the stuff, you know, Michael, I saw the stuff in the Michael theater. Michael Moriarty's great at He's that amazing movie. in yeah. that. Did that you, that's a very unique Did you ever see the documentary King Cohen? Yeah, I was there at the Silent Film Theater when it premiered. Oh. You're talking about the doc about him? About Larry. It's With him good. introducing it, he came to the... Oh, really? Oh, man, he's awesome. I think he passed pretty soon after that. I was shooting... I don't know if it was coming to America... No, it had to be Trading Places. But I'm shooting a scene on Park Avenue, and so I need my cops to do all this stuff. And I'm sh- I forgot which movie it was. Probably Trading Places. But I'm shooting this thing, and all of a sudden, the police officers come to me, and they go, Mr. Landis, we have to go. 
and my movie motorcycle cops go sirens blazing and then i see sirens and sirens police fire engines like what the fuck is going on it was amazing you know what it was what they were shooting Q, and Larry, without permission, is firing machine guns on, <laughs> on the top of the of the Chrysler building. I love it. I love it. You know I, those things where they're firing machine. Yeah, he didn't he, ask permission. He didn't. He probably didn't even have a permit. No. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, he's awesome. So, it, 1994, you go, you go from working for Michael to working with Eddie. What the hell was that like? Beverly Hills Cop 3. You got to design oh, that was your own movie. version of, of Disneyland. Disneyland was fun. That was a movie that was a money. <laughs> For me, it was the check. I got a call from Sherry Lansing. Eddie and I had a falling out on coming to America. So when I got a call from Sherry Lansing, she said, would you like to do Beverly Hills Cop 3? I said, who's playing Eddie Murphy? You know? <laughs> um and she said, no, he asked for you. And I said, what? So I went up to Eddie's house. He actually lives right up the street. He's right up the street, right? Yeah. yeah. So I, I went to Eddie's house and met with him, and, and he promised he'd never be late. And I said, okay, because the script was bad. And I was offered the original Beverly Hills Cop with Sylvester Stallone, actually. It was written for him. And if you see that movie, that was a terrible script, but a very funny movie. And it was funny because it was directed by Marty Bress. Martin Bress, very smart and funny guy. And he knew to let Eddie loose. And everything funny in that movie is not in the script. Mm -hmm. It's an ad lib or an improv. I mean, Bronson Pinchot, who's the best thing in the movie he with the Eddie, when yeah. they're with Eddie going, get, get the fuck out the of here. The <laughs> Completely <laughs> improvised. The Wayans brothers are in it, and all these guys are in it before they were who they were. and. There's some funny shit in there, and none of yeah, it. Yeah, I guess is. otherwise it's it's just sort of a by the numbers kind of it's fish, a fish, out, fish out of water thing. It's it's not good. And what was interesting was the movie's very funny. So I thought, okay, Eddie and I could do that because I've done it with Eddie before. You know, made it funnier, and he's brilliant. Hey, lads and ladies, Dave Gebro here. I abandoned my career and moved my family 3,000 miles to be able to focus exclusively on discography. And so if you're like me, and enough is just never enough, then please visit patreon.com slash discography and become one of our Patreon soldiers of sound. Discography is an entirely listener-supported show, and it's also intended to be a three times a week music deep dive experience. So do us both a favor and consider giving it a shot. Trust me, I'm working hard for the money, so hard for it, honey. There's the main show on Friday, a Monday wildcard episode, which is either a soul-bearing interview with that week's special guest, or an offshoot show like Queasy Listening and Rock Cousteau. And then on Wednesdays, there's the humdinger of them all, Discography's The Private Press with Paul Major. You got nothing to lose. If you don't dig it after a month, you're refunded. No questions asked. Once again, that's patreon.com slash discography. And so he was very professional making the movie, but he wasn't funny. And it was like, what the fuck? I was giving him situations to be funny. Not funny. And I finally, like three days in, I said, Eddie, why aren't you being funny? I mean, you know, Axel is a wise ass. And he says... Axel's a grown-up now. He's a man now. He's not a wise This is a character study. And it turned out, well, no, it turned out that at that moment in time, there were big hit movies with black leads doing action, like Wesley Snipes and uh, Sam Jackson and Denzel doing these big action, serious pictures. And Eddie wanted to do that. And, uh, you know, and the thing is, well, then you shouldn't be making a comedy. <laughs> right. Um, so I just went. I, that was a strange shoot. I just shot it. You know, I you just, didn't. You didn't give him any pushback. You just well, oh, there's only a... so much you can do when the actor's not going yeah, to yeah. be funny. What a severe miscalculation on his part. Because I mean, I think he. Just, you see that in a lot of his. You can tell when he cares. Yeah, I mean, these days, you, like for example, he wakes up during Bowfinger and then goes back to sleep for a bunch of movies. Well, in Bowfinger, that's it, your buddy Frank. Frank Oz. He created that. Well, Steve. Martin wrote that, but Eddie had that wonderful character as the so brother, good. and he was so good. really funny. Yeah. Then you move into, uh, I think, possibly your most underrated movie. I love The Stupids. And, oh, and, The Stupids. And the production number of uh, I'm My Own Grandpa is just I'm awesome. very proud of The Stupids. That was a, a strange situation. I made The Stupids, very happy with it. 
The Stupids are a series of children's books, and they're written for children under eight. So I made a movie and a wonderful screenplay by Brent Forrester, who went on from writing The Stupids to being the head writer of The Simpsons for nine years, you know. But The Stupids... You can see that with the sensibility of the film. Well, The Stupids is a very interesting movie because it's for children. It's for people under 10. And it plays great with those guys. But also, Brent's script, is ex- it's about Trump voters. It's extremely sophisticated because it takes place at all times on four entirely different levels of reality. It takes place in reality. Then it takes place in the stupid characters in Stanley and Petunia and his wife, the four of them, in their perception of reality, which is really not real, really twisted and different from reality, then they react to that reality, which is already not reality. And their reactions change reality. I don't know how to explain it, but it does. And it takes place on four levels at all times. And I think it's really funny. It's really good. And uh, it's a, it's but a, it's but it, it's a strange movie. It is a strange. It's very movie. stylized. Has <clears throat> puppets in it. You know who's in it that I'm very proud of. It's the only movie Bob Keishan ever made. Captain Kangaroo. <laughs> nice. And uh, Chris. So what's the and Bob Keishan and Christopher Lee play the same character. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a wild movie. And uh, oddly, Jim Belushi played Captain Kangaroo on Saturday Night Live in. 1985. I don't know I how know I remember that. that, but anyway, that's a movie. I, it has a wonderful score by Andrew Stone, and and that's a movie I like a lot. What happened to that was I'm finishing it. I'm in the last days of the mix in Toronto, and I get a call from the company Savoy, a guy named Victor Kaufman, who put up the money, and he says, uh, "I hate to tell you this, John, but we're in bankruptcy." So you have to shut down. Wow, so Jesus the first Christ. thing I did was, after I had up, I called my partner, Leslie, the producer. I said, take all the money we have, put it in a different account in a different bank. And so I finished the mix and made answer print. I worked for like two more weeks and just finished everything <laughs> so that, you know, which they were angry about apparently, but fuck them. <laughs> and then the company went into bankruptcy. So they had about 14 movies, 10 that were completed and four that weren't completed for sale. So I took the stupids over to Mike Eisner and Katzenberg and I said, here, watch this. And they said, great, we'll buy it and make a Disney movie. If it had been released as Walt Disney Presents the Stupids, I would have been fine. (laughs) But what happened was Victor Kaufman said, no, you have to buy all 14. No. (laughs) Well, you know. (laughs) So what happened was I finished it. It sat there for two or three years with the other movies. Then New Line Pictures buys it. And I think they bought it because Jenny McCarthy, Mm -hmm. who was a model, this is before she was a playmate. Mm -hmm. She was a model in Toronto who's got a small part in the movie. She had become Playmate of the Year and then was on MTV and was like a celebrity. And they looked at it and said, Jenny McCarthy, Tom Arnold, John Landis, they thought, it was a teenage tits and ass movie. Mm-hmm. It's a G-rated children's <laughs> film. <laughs> and I'll never forget, I'm at the, at the theater, what's it called, Harmony Gold or something, on Sunset. And they're screening it for Mitch Goldman. This is still New Line of Freddy's Nightmares, mm-hmm. not Lord of the Rings. Right, right. You know? mm-hmm. and the house, they called it the house that Freddy built. And they're watching the movie, which is completely stylized. you know. And, and what's his name? Bob Shea turns to me and he says, is this a children's movie? <laughs> and I go, yes. What the fuck are we going to do with this? And he leaves. <laughs> oh, Lord. So Mitch Goldman watches it, and he turns to me, and he goes, well, this is not what I expected. I said, what did you expect? Well, Jenny McCarthy. I mean, there's no bikinis in it. There's no nudity. There's no... I said, it's G-rated. It's for children 10 and under. Fuck. You know. So this is this has so, to, this so has to be frustrating. After frustrating, that. especially since I really like it. So they released it, kind of. The critics shit on it. Got a couple of good reviews. Actually, a couple of really smart reviews, but most of them 
just went, what the fuck is that? And dismissed it. And what was interesting was it was very successful on home video. It was discovered by kids. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very successful on home video. But it breaks my heart because that's a movie I'm quite proud of. I rented it a bunch of times. <laughs> I did. I love that movie. And that's the I'm My Own Grandpa sequence is really, really Well, it's really very beautiful. funny. It's amazing who's in that movie. Gilo Portocarvo, mm -hmm. Costa Gavras. Oh God, who's in that? Norman Jewison, Robert Wise, Adam McGoyan, David Cronenberg, but he's in a lot of my movies. <clears throat> right around the same time as it's released, in 98 you do Blues Brothers 2000. I mainly want to focus on two musical performances. Okay, before you do, just that was a movie that was greenlit, very happy with the script that Danny and I wrote, and then they changed leadership at Universal. And it's already greenlit, but the new management, the new head of production, the woman says, you have to have a black blues brother. We said, what? And the story you have for the John Goodman character, I don't like it because of this, you have to change it. So I said to Danny, wait a minute, we're gonna have three Blues Brothers? And without the story, John Goodman has no character. I mean, he's standing there. Danny says, we must put these people on film. I mean, he was gonna com compromise. I said, Dan, it's not worth it. Anyway, we do a draft. Then they say, children don't know who the Blues Brothers are. You have to put a child in it. <laughs> oh, Lord. And we go, what? You know. So we do another draft and another draft. I think we put us through like 10 drafts. And by the time they were finished, it was terrible. And I said, there's no movie here. And John Goodman's got nothing to do. The whole time is your gut just telling you, fuck this. Oh, I, I really didn't want to. I really did not want to do it. I just said, there's no reason to do this. But to focus on something positive so, from so it. So what happened, what happened was Danny was desperate to do it. I did it. And the studio, they really tried to fuck me in every possible way. I mean, they... They, we made it for very little money, and there's some big, really amazing car stuff in it, but it's not good. Then they retimed it. You know, I, I finished a print, and they retimed the photography to make it bright. So the movie's like 50% of what I wanted, but, you know, there's no, we get no control over it. I just, you know, that was a total, that sort of really, that whole experience was demoralized. It was wonderful to work with musicians. Okay, so uh, a couple performances in particular. Yeah. <clears throat> you produced a Dr. John session, a late night Dr. John well, session. Paul Schaefer and Dr. John. A, a cover of Donovan's Season of the Witch, which yeah. is beautiful. Yeah, well, that was Dr. John. It really is great. It's really, really nice. And then you assemble, uh, you know, I can't think of many more uh, ridiculously overstuffed bands well, you with know, amazing be, people in well, you say, for, who are the keyboards? Uh, Stevie Winwood, Billy Preston, Dr. John. I got the list right here. Paul Gary, Schaefer. Gary U.S. Bonds, Jeff Skunk Baxter, Eric Clapton, Clarence Clemens, D Jack D. Jeanette, Bo Diddley, John Faddis, Isaac Hayes, Dr. John, B.B. King, Charlie Musselwhite, Billy Preston, Lou Rawls, Joshua Redman, Paul Schaefer, Coco Taylor, Travis Tritt, Jimmy Vaughn, Grover Washington Jr., Willie Weeks, and Steve Winwood in one band for two performances, is that correct? Well, it was one day, so we were able to do it twice. And that was the Louisiana Gator Boys. Yeah, it's a battle of the bands. It's, it's I remember it amazing. And, and, and you live, know, when I, when, I listen, live. when I listen to it, I'm like, before I put it on, all right, this is going to be so chaotic because everyone's going to be playing at once, trying to showboat. <laughs> But um, it's really nice. It's really well put together. Well, you can see Paul running around because he's conducting it. You know, and also it was very interesting because some of those guys, you know, can read music. But half of them can't read music. And so it's very interesting to get them all on the same thing. And the weirdest thing was Bo Diddley, who I know Bo because I don't know if you know this, but he plays a, a straight part in uh, Trading Places. He's mm -hmm. the pawnbroker. Mm-hmm. Philadelphia, it's worth 50 cents. Anyway, um, so I knew Bo, but you know, when they're playing and they start jamming and stuff, no matter what, it would sort of turn into bump, 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 you know, and it was like, whoa, please don't do that. What's nice is um, Clapton, Eric, told me that one of his least favorite songs in the world, he hates the song, the one everybody sings at the end. 
of the movie. The Louisiana Gator Boys? Yeah. Anyway, he hates that song. And uh, I said, I'm sorry, but you know, we that's what we're going to do. And it's funny to watch him because he did some really interesting stuff. It was Toronto in the summer, so there were like 15 movies shooting, which meant I had to get multiple cameras. I had the F level of the extra guys because all the other, you know, the, the B, C, and D guys were all working. So I had really terrible cameramen. And it was very difficult because we had so little time. What What are your three best movies, in, in your opinion? I don't know. No, I mean the ones that forget about audience reaction. And all that I stuff. don't know. What are your What are your the movies that you? I enjoy Three Amigos because I think it's funny. I enjoy Animal House because I think the the performers are wonderful. I enjoy American Werewolf. American Werewolf's the closest movie that the finished movie is. My original intention. Right, right. You know, I mean, there are moments in all the other movies, but it's interesting. I mean, you don't get to make the movies you necessarily want to make. My, I would love to make westerns. I love fucking westerns. Most of westerns. all, if you could set up anything, if you had a, now, a carte blanche, what, what would it be? It would be a western. It would be a western? Western, absolutely. And, and musicals, real musicals. I'd love to do a western. And... And three, see the thing with Three Amigos, even though it's a comedy, it's a true western, and it's just Walter Hill once said to me, you know, if they knew how much fun it was to make a western, they wouldn't let us, <laughs> because you're riding horses, you're outside. I mean, it's just the best. Do you want to make one of those Walter Hill masculine bravado movies, or do you want to do another? No, comic just anything in the West. I mean, just yeah. a, I'd love to do straight ones. You talk about Jim Mangold. I mean, he got to remake uh, 310 to Yuma. Yeah. I thought the original was better than his, but I, I mean, that's a good story. There, there are a lot of wonderful westerns. So, Do you ever see Seven Men from Now? No. Randolph Scott. It's a Bud Butterchur. Check that out, Seven Men from Now. It's so good. I mean, I love westerns. Ducky Sucker. Ducky Sucker is a strange movie. It is a strange <laughs> movie. <laughs> that terrible Irish accent. <laughs> Rod Steiger. So look at looking back on your whole career, uh, you happy about it? Are there? What, oh, I. You know, what's the through line for you? I don't know. I mean, I I certainly am am thrilled with the people I worked with. I mean, there's some. I mean, especially the singers and musicians I've worked with. It's ridiculous. I mean, I really have. I really enjoyed working with Erica Badu. She's a good actress, and you never saw the movie. I didn't. Because oh it, well, she's great. Because there's a kid in it. So you wouldn't see the movie? No. You, you saw the stupid? I stopped watching the Brady Bunch when Oliver was introduced. When they put in the kid, it's the, it's the, it's the shark jumping moment. <laughs> what? <laughs> I never watched it because you always... You should do more talking. <laughs> yes, I can't get a word in here. <laughs> I talk a lot on the regular episodes. <laughs> well, we didn't talk that much about music, but I have been... I have. I, I told David, I, I, I have had amazing experiences. And one of them was Jim O'Rourke and I went to see, went to Vegas and went to see Elvis Presley in the early 70s. Mm. So he's still not fully fat Elvis yet. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. And But we went to see him. But he was, he was joke Elvis. I was born in 1950, so I grew up. My mother was always an Elvis fan. Right. But growing up, all I saw were those terrible movies. Right, yeah. And really they were kind of terrible movies. There's so many. So many terrible We've thought about doing Elvis for this show, but you really can't because there's like 50 bad movie soundtracks. Well, you just things. do the good ones. Yeah, that's not what we're but really the, doing. But the uh, <laughs> terrible movies. And so I, and I thought the Elvis was... The problem is we do everything. <laughs> and I thought Elvis was a joke. I really did. So we went to see him kind of as a joke at, at the Hilton... It wasn't the Hilton. It was the International Hotel. Mm -hmm. Later, it became the Hilton International. I think there's a movie about that period of him, Elvis at the International that's Hotel. That's the way it is. That's yeah. the way it is, yeah. and yeah. It's, it's not a good movie. Yeah. But uh, There's some great songs in it. Though. I'm Patch sure, it but the show, when he... We were had good seats, and we're there to mock and laugh. Hippies. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> but he put on such a great show, and he was... Right. I mean, his presence, his whole thing, and very funny. He was very funny. This is before he took himself so seriously, because he did go crazy like they all do. Boy, he was great. He was great. And I had no idea he had such a magnificent voice. Mm -hmm. And we were like, holy shit. 
I just didn't expect it. I remember that. That was something. Yeah. And we saw Sinatra. My wife and I saw Sinatra. Frank Sinatra was good friends with Don Rickles, as I was. So we, we Don opened for him sometimes. And we saw Sinatra. And the first time we saw him was at Caesar's Palace. And he was great. Great. And then we saw him two more times, and he shouldn't have been on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he should have retired. And then, I, you know, I, was, I thought about it. I have seen amazing stuff just by being in L.A. Because I remember in the 60s, we used to go down to the Sunset Strip and where car, that uh, train is now, the car Yeah, yeah, are, right. There, that's like a lot. And there used to be like a stage there. And uh, the uh, Mothers of Invention used to play there all the time, mm-hmm. just for free. We used to you ever go, see like a love or the birds or any of the other? Yeah, houses, all of the, them. The doors. Oh, I saw the doors. Of, oh, in fact, I knew Jim Morrison uh, because it's now called the Jim Bridges Theater. It used to be called the McGowan Hall at UCLA. Now it's called the Jim Bridges Theater. But it's a, it's a movie theater. It's got those horrible wooden seats like a school. But they used to show at UCLA theater, film, and television a movie every day at noon. It was like, what? what is it today? You know, is it uh, 400 Blows? Is it mm-hmm. His Girl Friday? It was always something. And I lived in Westwood behind the, my parents' house behind the Veterans Cemetery. So to get there, I could get there on a skateboard or a bike in 20 minutes, really close. Mm-hmm. So when I could, I often would go to UCLA to watch a movie. <laughs> and, and I saw all these westerns actually sitting next to this guy who was always offering me marijuana with talking <laughs> it was jim morrison oh my and God. i didn't realize that that was jim morrison until i saw the doors at the whiskey a go-go mm-hmm. and i went hey i know that guy <laughs> <laughs> he's my pusher <laughs> no i was he always offered me a joy and That's i was funny. Like, you know like 15 and 40. just to Clarify, you're in the entirety of your drug experience is smoking one joint once, right? Pretty much. Well, no, I've been exposed to a lot of drugs, but the only time I partook a joint was uh, visiting a girl at Santa Cruz College in, uh, in the dorm. And I remember it was like a very, you know when you're between like 14 and 20, where you get a hard on just yes. if a bus goes by, you get yes. a hard on, you know, and just like, and I would ejaculate when a bus went by. Oh. <laughs> Cut that out! <laughs> <laughs> you lose all your audience. It's a phallic thing. But well, what no, was no, interesting was I remember how aroused I was that whole weekend because it was a co-ed dorm. I went to the bathroom and I'm sitting on the toilet, you know, and there's a door, but. All these girls come in and start taking showers. It was like it was like one of those like Porky's movies. Or something. <laughs> and I'm like, holy shit! They're all these. And I sort of got it finished and like I'm leaving and I look back like I'm not looking back. Anyway, this person I was visiting, who was a lovely girl, she. It became very clear that if I shared this joint with her. I would get late. <laughs> so I did. And it just gave me a headache. I'm unaware of any other effect than a headache. Did it Did it work, though? Did you get late? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's okay. But I had a headache. <laughs> and that's, I. you know, I got to say, I am just as your friend, I am so grateful that you don't have an addictive personality based on the, the company you kept during the 70s and 80s. <laughs> you really skated through. No, I didn't skate. No, through. I mean, I if just you had a different kind of personality. I was my wife, same thing. You know, yeah. I was, John Belushi used to call Deborah nightlife. You'd go, you know, ten o'clock, Deborah, gotta go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, he would get mad at me because on Saturday night, if I'm up that late, I'm out. I'm not watching TV. You know, I'm going to bed because we never really watched Saturday Night Live, and he'd call on Sunday to see the show. He would call every Sunday to ask for we yeah for like not every like but maybe fifteen times you know yeah when he did something he liked and he did call me once and say I'm doing a skit you'll like tonight and I watched the show and it was brilliant it was the 
when he played Elizabeth Taylor. Oh, that is awesome. <laughs> when and he chokes up the... And he starts <laughs> choking. <laughs> and he's really choking and yeah. gagging. It's horrible. And then he gives himself the high yes. yeah. And then he starts eating the chicken again. <laughs> yeah, that's starts awesome. Eating the chicken. It was funny. I actually like some of his... Uh, you and I have talked about Neighbors. I actually like Neighbors. Even I like Neighbors. John and Danny hated the experience. And for some reason... I forgot who directed it, but they hated. Avildsen. They hated the director. It was Avildsen, and I know Belushi would call you all the time and tell and you they to come, come and take over the movie. Yeah. John, I'm not going to do that. And I think that everyone was upset because they played the, opposite. Yeah, everyone yeah. thought Danny should be the other guy, and John. Although I, I liked I that. Think, it was, yeah, I and I liked that. I thought they were both really good. Danny's fucking crazy in the movie, and Danny. If you give Danny the right character. He's so brilliant. He's, I think, in in a way, it's his best performance. It's very chaotic, and you don't know where he's going well, or what his so, intention he's is. So scary. Yeah, yeah. I, I I love Danny in uh, was it Driving Miss Daisy because it's like, this is the biggest goy. I mean, it was so weird. Do Driving Miss Daisy is about a Jewish woman and her Jewish son and a black driver, and in the movie. They made them so not Jewish. I mean, so not Jewish. I said, Danny, you're like the biggest goy I have ever <laughs> seen. I mean, it was like, are they supposed to be Jewish? Yes, Danny. You, did you see the play? I saw the play in Melbourne, Australia with Angela Lansbury and James Earl Jones. <laughs> Bizarre. <laughs> and uh, they were so good. But the play's not so good, but they were so good. Listen, we could talk forever, but I want to wrap this up, and I, I want to tell you that, uh, you know, to everyone that I've spoken to that um, we're going to do this interview, they were so happy. Your career truly is, you know, even though you'll, you know, push away a compliment or what have you, and there you go with the crossed arms. It's <laughs> well, I'm just waiting. <laughs> it's, it, it's a, I think you have, you've had a great career. I, oh, I, I've been very lucky. I yeah. mean, my, the, what I'm really lucky about is I've made about eight or nine movies that, you know, after 40 years or something, they're still playing. Yeah. And that is amazing. Uh, you've, made, you've made great movies throughout your entire career, but I would definitely say from, you know, that 10 years from... Well, you're thinking about commercial success. Just to sit down and say everything from Kentucky Fried Movie to Coming to America. Kentucky Fried Movie was made in the 70s. Coming to America was made in 89 or That something. 10 years is really amazing. Almost every director uh, that I know of does not have a block of movies like that. You've made great movies after that. but I'm I'd saying rather that have made more movies. I'd you've made a rather, lot of movies. I've made a lot of movies, yeah. but not as much as I'd like to. I haven't made You'll a movie make, in 10 years. I know, Burke and Hare was the last movie I made. Which is very good. I'm available. Anyone have a <laughs> yeah. lot of money? To <laughs> <laughs> Schlock you can two. send your check. Schlock to two, everybody. Oh, God. $60,000 is all we need to fund it. This has been an interview with the legendary mythological John Landis. Thanks so much for, for tuning in. Uh, definitely like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and follow us on the podcast platform of your choice. Those are the exact words that Spotify, I was Spotify, Apple, for. Overcast, whatever you do. That's right. Just hit subscribe. John, we love you. Thank you so much for going over the time and thank you for breaking your diet with us. Today. It has you been our pleasure. Marriage, but other than that, <laughs> thank you, do boys. We All right, that just about does it. A heartfelt discography thanks goes out to our graphic designer, Todd Zimmer, my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason, Joe Kennedy, the mythological mensch himself, John Landis, for going way, way over the allotted time, my incredibly loyal fans, and especially the entire Patreon community, the soldiers of sound. 
I love every last one of you, and this show would not exist without you, my friends. Speaking of friends, it's high time for some new ones. They're in our Facebook group, so get ye over there. Discography Soldiers of Sound. That's the best way to find out what's coming up on the show, but there's a hell of a lot more. You get recaps of the day in music history, the ability to pitch questions to guests, polls that put you in the driver's seat on guest and band decisions, access to a thriving creative hub if you're looking for a collaborator, and much more. So make sure you don't miss out. You can find the link to the discography soldiers of sound facebook page right there in the show notes and if you don't mess with the zuck hey it's no sweat just email me at info at discography.com and i'll keep you regular as it were but wait just a minute this is just the entrance to the rabbit hole no need to stop now because we're on a roll join us as we descend down 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 on discography's week-long cold sun werewolf moon deep dive wherein we train the microscope down on an embarrassment of bonus john landis content and an almost uncharacterizable initial entree with cold sun's bill miller where paul majors put through his paces in an impromptu recorded session for the ages. Another way to dive even deeper is to get thee directly to the first, second, third, or fourth John Landis episodes. That's numbers 85, 89, 90, and 92, wherein the director talks to Discography about Kentucky Fried Movie, Animal House, The Blues Brothers, Trading Places, Spies Like Us, Coming to America, on and on and on. If you're a Patreon subscriber, then you already know to keep your ears peeled throughout the week, because this Monday continues with an absolute obscene of abundance of John Landis with their Patreon-only wildcard episode, John Landis Volume 6, not to mention Wednesday's incredible Patreon-only episode of Discography's The Private Press, which we're calling cold sun and hot takes it's the bill miller show in addition i can't recommend enough that you tune in to our brother podcast vintage annals archive this week we're highlighting episode six bj snowden if you know then you know but if you don't know bj snowden is a singer songwriter and musician with a unique style who sings about the important things in life whether it's the provinces of canada santa claus or judge joe brown the great Rich Wexler is doing amazing work over there, so don't miss it. That's the Vintage Annals Archive podcast. And of course, be sure to mark your calendars, because next Friday, May 19th, we're coming at you with part one of a nine-hour holy shit interview with David Pajo that inspects every last corner of his career. The next few weeks are going to blow you away. And so, from now till then, don't let our youth go to waste, lads and ladies. It's Discography. Graffiti.